My name is Jeremy Park. I'm with City Current. We're honored to have you join us for this webinar. As I mentioned, with COVID-19 and everything going on, it's so, so important to be able to have a great team, to be flexible, but obviously to uh, manage security and do everything that needs to be done from an IT uh, space. And so this is one of those where when we talk, talk to our partners and friends and everyone said, hey, what's, what's on your mind? What are some of the challenges you're faced with? We heard a lot around IT and being able to effectively manage that. And so that's where we went to VC3. They're charter partners with City Current. So we know them extremely, extremely well. Um, we said, hey, here are some of the struggles that our partners and friends are struggling with. Could you put together a webinar? And so that's where Gary and the VC3 team stepped up and said, let's do this and uh, let's, let's make sure we can help. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Gary Wiseman, he's the regional manager with VC3, and he's going to introduce the panelists and give you some background and then dive right in. So Gary Wiseman, VC3, take it away, sir. All right. Well, Jeremy, City Current, thank you so much for having us today. I appreciate the team I have with me as well as everybody that's participating today. And what I'd like to do is uh, go around the table uh, virtually, obviously, uh, and introduce our team. So uh, and each of these team members have a very specific role in how we will uh, uh, do this webinar and how their role interacts with uh, IT and growing your organization. So with that, I'll uh, ask Joe Hallen, who is our Chief Inf Information Security Officer for BC3, to introduce himself. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Hallen. As Gary just said, I am BC3's Chief Information Security Officer. Um, I've been with BC3 for over 11 years, um, had many different roles with the organization, but in the past couple of years, I've been very focused on security. Um, as BC3's security officer, I don't just look out for VC3. I'm also always trying to understand and look at how the security landscape is changing and how that impacts our customers so that we can be guiding our customers uh, with the most effective security solutions as well. Um, so th so that, that's who I am. That's my role. And thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you today. All right. Thank you, Joe Barclay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barclay Greer. I am a virtual chief information officer for VC3. I've been with the company for a little over 10 years, the last five as a uh, VCIO, and I am the VCIO that supports LifeLink. Okay. And then Erica. And good morning. I'm Erica Warren with LifeLink Anesthesia. I'm our Chief Operations Officer. And I've worked directly with BC3 throughout our partnership uh, for, I guess, almost eight years now. And we've kind of grown together and, and weathered storms. And so I'm appreciative to be able to work with you guys in this webinar today. All right. Well, with that, we will uh, dive right in. Let's talk a little bit about what is it, what's in it for you. So we're going to share some ideas for getting the most out of your IT to help your business grow. Uh, we're we're going to accomplish that by taking you through the five elements of strong IT leadership, and then we're going to combine these elements in a COVID-19 case study to give you a feel for how that played out. Uh, we will close with some takeaways that you could implement in your business today, and if you did, I firmly believe it will have a transformative effect. And as we walk through this, our panelists will share their experiences and thoughts around these uh, topics. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is turn it back over to Erica and give a little bit of background about LifeLink and then I will uh, follow up with a, a little blurb on BC3. Sure, absolutely. So LifeLink started as a local anesthesia staffing company in 2006. Um, at the time we were two employees and some CRNAs moonlighting to fill needs at local hospitals. In 2010, we sort of um, initiated a growth strategy and started two out-of-state contracts that year providing service to ambulatory surgery centers. And since that time, we've sort of maintained this dynamic growth mode where we're turning, we're growing revenue and employee count year over year. At some point in that, with I think about 10 employees on board, we decided to partner with BC3 for our IT needs. And they've been with us through the growth to 300 employees across 16 states. And we've implemented various strategies and tools that we'll talk about a little later, I'm sure. Um, so we've grown kind of in scale and scope together through this few years to meet our needs. Okay, thank you. 
So a little bit of background about VC3. VC3 actually acquired Master IT in November of last year, and they're on, I'd say, at a pretty aggressive uh, growth trajectory. VC3 is a managed IT service provider with over 150 employees across multiple states. And we started, uh, VC3 started in 1994, and we specialize in cloud technologies, network infrastructure, web application development, SharePoint, telephony, and security. And we have a strong focus in the government sector, healthcare, financial services, and many other businesses. And with that, let's, uh, let's dive right into the five elements of strong IT leadership. So um, as we talk about this uh, in the different elements, uh, this is probably foundational in its diligent communication. I think when you, we look at the other four aspects, all of these have to build on communication. And so what do you think about when you talk about diligent communication? Other words that might come to mind are constant communication, consistent, effective communication. Other things may come to mind. Let's dive in and see how these play out. So with that, Erica, would you mind sharing us with us your experience around meeting rhythms, uh, leadership access, and reporting? Absolutely. So being in dynamic growth mode, everything at LifeLink was constantly changing. We were evaluating new strategies and platforms. And initially, we were doing this independently with our operations team. And it became clear that we needed to have an IT hat at the table. Um, so thankfully, VC3 was able to begin being a part of our weekly managers meetings um, to hear the changes that were coming so that they could also participate in our strategy sessions and guide us to make good decisions instead of creating a mess that they would later have to clean up. And I think this has saved us a lot of headaches, um, a lot of money probably, in that we were able to take a collaborative approach to implement the appropriate strategies on the front end to support our constant growth. Um, and I feel like their leadership team has been a part of our leadership team as a result of this. We're seeing their faces on a weekly basis as well as a quarterly basis and really having conversations and reviewing our business strategies that, that I feel like they're invested in as well. Um, and through these meetings, we've also developed this earned trust among one another so that we truly value them as a part of our team and not necessarily just an outside vendor. Um, been invaluable to us as an organization. And so it is, it's very much a two-way street, right? In order to earn that trust, we have to prove our value and prove that we can deliver the solutions that you come to expect. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Let's go on to, um, oops, organizational understanding. The next two sections, so this one in collaborative partnership, they're really more like a hand in glove. They go, go together. Uh, and Barclay will share with us her perspective and experiences on these topics. Thank you, Gary. Um, Erica alluded to this a moment ago about uh, planning business goals around the operational side of the house, but a lot of times, IT is left out until the last minute to implement said technologies or processes that have been decided on by the operational uh, side of the house. However, as we all know, not having each department uh, at the table when decisions are made, that can lead to clunky implementations or challenges within uh, new opportunities. So for IT to have a seat at the table to not only discuss the bits and bytes of what is going on uh, from that perspective, but also truly understand what the vision and mission of the company is. And um, Erica, if you can just share how we've done that over time, because like you said, it's, it's been a very long time together and we've grown exponentially on both sides of the house. And uh, if you could just share a little bit there. Sure, I think I might talk just about a few examples of how having VC3 at our table has helped. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have clinical teams working in 16 different states um, in about 50 facilities across the country. And it's important for us to be able to share data in a secure way. 
um, and to be able to communicate securely with our clinicians. And we don't, we don't possess internally the um, skill set necessary to develop a secure IT strategy for that exchange. So having that partnership, having uh, VC3 listen to where we're growing and how we're growing, and ultimately grow to understand how our business functions has allowed us to take their suggestions, have them presented in a very comfortable way um, in a routine meeting uh, where they're partnered with us and be able to implement those pretty easily. So we've done everything from implementing um, document sharing strategies to communication platforms. Um, and then after implementation, we're also auditing those and reviewing them um, because as technology improves, we're having to go back and uh, make sure that we're using the most modern technologies available to us. So having you guys present has really made that a very comfortable process it's not as though you're coming in once a year and, and making a suggestion and, and walking away. Well, I will awesome. say from my perspective, um, some of the things, like you said, we had some challenges in the beginning, especially surrounding some of these hospitals and regarding cybersecurity, being able to know what business growth you have coming down the pipe has helped us implement the solutions mm -hmm. in a more timely manner to keep your staff up and running efficiently which has been, I think, mutually beneficial on both sides. Uh, so that leads us from organizational understanding more into the collaborative partnership, which we've already talked about. And being able to hear some of the challenges from a business aspect and how IT can support that is our number one goal, especially from my role as a VCIO, to give not just the, here's the solution, but here's your goal in business here's how IT can support it. But by the way, did you think about workflows and things like that? And I know we're working currently on some additional opportunities uh, surrounding better collaboration, especially during this time. Um, Erica, on the goal part, um, is there any perspective that you can give on how it's different, IT's different now than it has been in the past? Well, I think, again, having you guys understand where, um, having everyone on the same page as we know where we're going as an organization. Um, during our weekly meetings, we're talking about the growth opportunities that exist, the areas we're moving into. Um, so certainly you guys have a working knowledge of our goals just as anyone else on our operations team. So that's very helpful. Now, I think looking at today where we are in a post-COVID world, Having a strategy that's flexible and somewhat fluid has been important to us. And I know we'll talk a little bit in detail about that later, but having, um, having your team consistently hand in hand walk through these challenges together has been, been great. It's given us the opportunity to implement tools that have allowed our staff to work without missing a beat, which has been really great. That's awesome. Um, one good example of a goal to keep in mind right now, I think not just in the medical community, but in uh, business overall, especially in a post COVID world is uh, cybersecurity. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Howland to talk more about how VC3 supports our clients, not just in the medical community, but also in business overall. Joe? Hey, be hey before we transition, I, I just wanna go back and touch on one thing, if we could uh, with Erica, because I think it's important and it goes to the effectiveness of a collaborative uh, partnership. We actually, and if I miss this and somehow my head was in the cloud, we, we proposed a solution to LifeLink. And Erica said, hey, that sounds really good, but the cost, golly, can y'all do something about that? And uh, we did take it back to the drawing board and came up with a solution, Erica, that I think was much more uh, cost effective uh, secure and you ended up uh, choosing that solution. You want to talk about anything about that? And that was with the, the splash top versus like team beer and other remote access tools. Absolutely. Um, as part of our moving people home strategy, we have an anesthesia billing team that works here in our office. And it was really important that they were able to securely access files um, obviously, we could not afford to um, immediately purchase uh, laptops for everyone, 
So we needed some strategy that would allow them to securely access their data. As Gary mentioned, the first option was great, it was effective, it was quick, but it was extremely expensive or out, out of line for our budget, maybe not extremely expensive, but not in line with our budget, knowing that we were heading into a time when 75% um, of our revenue comes from elective case volume. And so we were able to have that open, honest conversation. I wasn't fearful of, of saying we can't, this is not something we can implement now, what other options are available. And that was well received. Uh, VC3 went right back to the drawing board and quickly came up with another solution that we were able to deploy very quickly. And it worked really well. It did, and I, I appreciate that feedback. Um, sorry for the inter interruption there, but uh, Joe, with that, we'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, security focus. Great, thanks, Gary. Um, first of all, I'll just say this is, this is going to be a brief discussion on security because I could easily consume the rest of this time talking about common threats and current threats and what security solutions are. And obviously, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I will say there's a couple things that we're focusing on here. And, and really, there are two different things on this slide. One is compliance and one is security. And those really are different components that are related. Um, first off, when we're talking about compliance, if we're talking about LifeLink or a healthcare organization, certainly all of our minds go to HIPAA. We know there are HIPAA regulations that, that lay out uh, guidelines of how we must protect our data, what we must do to protect our data, how we must use that data, access that data, who can access that data. If you are in the financial services industry, you have the same types of regula regulations that are very clearly dictate what you need to do to protect customer data. Um, if you're not in those organizations, you may think, well, I don't have any regulations. I don't have any compliance concerns that I've got to worry about. Well, unfortunately for you, every single state has rules around how you must protect data that you have on your network and certainly uh, PII and social security numbers, which we think of from the perspective of our customers and the people we work with, we think, well, I don't have any of that information. I'm not trading that information. But all of us have that information on our networks in the form of our employees' information, our employees' data, and that needs to be protected as well. Um, the good news is that if you implement a, a real robust and thorough security solution, you're, you're not only going to be protecting yourself if you're not in a compliance industry, but you're also going to be protecting yourself if you are in healthcare and you are in financial services. The same security best practices are, are going to meet many of the HIPAA and financial services regulations as they are just going to meet your own sanity, safe, peace of mind, protecting your own organization. Um, so, so those things align very tightly. Um, I, I will say that currently the, the biggest threat we are seeing, and I'll, I'll stick to this one for the moment for today, is email. 95% of the successful attacks against organizations in the past couple of years has started in email. It's not the Hollywood hacker coming in through the back door anymore. Yes, those threats still exist. We can't ignore them. But 95% of the attacks are coming in through email. They are targeting our, our employees. So we have got to be very meticulous about educating our employees, helping them recognize what potential phishing attacks look like, testing them to see if they are falling for phishing attacks, making sure that we protect them from those threats so that they aren't inadvertently opening a back door or opening an attack into our organization just because they're curious about a link or an attachment that's in their email. So we've got to be educating our employees. And then I think the second thing we've got to do is we've got to focus on multi-factor authentication for our employees mm -hmm. because if they get successfully phished and they give away their credentials, their ID and their password, I don't care what your password complexity is, how creative you get, how long you make it, how frequently you make them change that password. If they're giving it away, it's not going to do you any good. So that multi-factor authentication solution really does help protect your employees and protect your organization. Um, when it comes to the COVID and all of us shifting to our, our home offices and working from home, something we really all have to be very thoughtful about, intentional about is, as Erica was talking about, what data do I have that is protected and is, is protected by these regulations that I must comply with? And, and, and how does that change when I am working from home? 
Do I need to put uh, limits on my employees being able to download that data? I, I've maybe created this nice protective shell around my organization in the office, and now somebody's at home, if they're moving that data out of that office, it doesn't leave that protective shell. So what do I need to do to address that? How do I need to protect that? Do I need to prevent those, those transfers from happening and force employees to only access that data when they're on the network? So lots of different things we really need to be thinking about and be thoughtful about from the compliance side, but also from the security side. Again, the good news is if you are really following one of these frameworks, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's the, the financial regulations, whether you've just gone out and downloaded the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology framework on cybersecurity, if you are doing those things, you are, are, are putting good protections around your organization and you're probably addressing many of your compliance requirements as well. Not all. All of the compliance frameworks have lots of paper and policies and processes that you need to put in place as well. But certainly from a techno technical standpoint, protecting the information, you will, be, you will be addressing those requirements. And if you haven't started that process, if it's something you're looking for, if it's something you need to do, I, I encourage you, one, to seek outside guidance. Find somebody, find a security partner who can really walk you through those processes, who understands security, who understands how the technologies that are out there align with those frameworks and can protect you, but also don't get intimidated by the sheer volume and the complexity of IT security. Like everything else, we have to take it in little bits. We have to look at it and say, okay, what's my next step? What's the first thing I can do to protect my organization? Okay, what's next in line? What's next in line? A lot of organizations, they took a look, take a look at everything that's out there. They get overwhelmed by the information, overwhelmed by the complexity, overwhelmed by the expense and the cost, frankly, and they, they, they get intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Find a partner who can guide you through that process. Find somebody who can really assist with that and, and build a long-term relationship with them. You don't want them to come in and set up security and then walk away and not talk to them again. You need to have that long-term relationship because security is always changing, it's always evolving. There are always new threats in the landscape, always things happening um, that, that require adjustment and modifications to what we're doing. Um, and I, I, will, I will leave it at that. If you want more on security, um, kick me an email and I will, I will happily share presentations and lots of other detail around security with you. Joe, yeah, that's awesome advice. And thank you for sharing that. I tell you, so many times uh, you would think security is not an afterthought in today's uh, landscape and businesses, but uh, sometimes we still see it. It's, it's, they don't address it until an event occurs and then you're in crisis management mode, which is a great segue to our, our last. So we've talked about diligent communication, organizational understanding, collaborative partnership, we've talked about security, and all of these things lead to your ability to maneuver, to uh, hopefully mitigate your exposure to crisis, uh, competitive threats, and business needs as things evolve and adapt. Um, so, you know, when I think about agility, I was thinking about this or an agile response. It reminded me of this quote, if you're ready, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're in trouble. And why I thought about that, it's because it, come, it, it comes to being agile and being prepared. So, you know, playing the waiting game and hoping it never happens to you is a very, very dangerous game uh, to play. So all businesses must be prepared to respond to changes in the business landscape, regardless of where they're coming from. And Joey uh, talked about several different uh, vectors. So whether it's a HIPAA violation, disgruntled employee, pandemic, competition, it, it doesn't really matter. You've got to be ready to respond. So a, another way to think about it, uh, sorry for the analogies, is um, when you think about athletes. So athletes' ability to have agility. Ooh, that's the only rhyme you're going to get out of this presentation. But athletes' ability to have agility comes through preparedness, and businesses are the same. They are not agile on the first day. It takes practice. It takes time. It takes preparation. And so much the same way businesses need to plan, communicate, create vision, goals, security, strategy, all the things that we've been talking about today in uh, our webinar. Basically. 
what this does, it culminates into a roadmap. So how do we get from point A to point B? How do we navigate COVID? How do we navigate a potential security breach? How do we navigate uh, someone giving away their email credentials? And so all of these uh, things allow us to be prepared. So as you think about different crises, and I've named a few, you know, for data backup, all right, so most everybody has a data backup, but do they have a data backup plan? Do they test the restores? How do they know if the data is valid uh, when the time comes that they have to go and restore? What about business continuity? You know, every time, yeah, often when we hear about business continuity, people are thinking about IT only, but what about your employees? So COVID was very much of a disruptor in sending ever all the employees home. I don't know about you, but quite frankly, I didn't think about that from a planning. So we had to adapt very quickly. Um, competitive threats, uh, technol technology is always about doing things faster, better, cheaper. And how do we do that? We supplant uh, remedial tasks so that we can focus on more important things like strategy, business growth, client satisfaction, employee advancement, all the more important things. And this allows us to be uh, better prepared for competitive threats. And then uh, on new business needs, um, there are many different factors that involve uh, growth. Uh, you think about expansion, so your business is growing. Uh, product life cycles, products come and go, changes in the economy. Do you have a, pro a plan and a process in place to address all these issues? And not only that, it's kind of like uh, way back when we, we started doing all this uh, disaster recovery planning. Uh, it's been many years ago. And we found that when you create the plan, it would sit in a book and then no one would ever look at it again. So as you do these plans, they are actually living, breathing documents that need to be revisited and I think uh, Erica was talking about weekly, monthly, quarterly, because they constantly change and you have to adapt to those change. So um, all these things tied together just help us better prepare for maneuvering the changing land landscape that we're faced with every day. So to pull all of these five elements together, uh, diligent communication, organization, under uh, collaborative partnership and security and agility. I'd like to turn it over to Erica and ask, and Erica, I just want to ask you, what does it look like from, you know, as we take into consideration the recent COVID uh, pandemic, how did all these uh, things come together and play out for you from your perspective? Absolutely. So it almost makes me laugh at how quickly COVID changed our landscape. Um, we were having one of our routine meetings on March 11th, and at the end of the meeting, we had this brief conversation about thinking about a disaster plan, what if COVID is a real crisis, what would we do? Um, and really, we didn't have a lot of time to think or plan because by the following Wednesday, we were sending everyone to work from home. And so given the background and the experience that we had in our partnership, we were quickly able to, on the fly, devise a plan that allowed our billing staff to go home and work and still access the information necessary. Um, they were able to work effectively and efficiently from their homes and safely. So that was really great. Um, and all of that happened within seven days, not even seven business days, just seven regular days, which Again, it makes me laugh that we didn't have necessarily this plan in place. I don't think anyone had a plan of what to do if there's a pandemic that strikes America and everyone has to stay home for a month. Um, but we were able to do so with very little interruption. And through this, we also were able to continue our growth as an organization and really enrich the culture of who we are. Um, one of the things that we've always struggled with is connecting all of our teams. Again, we're kind of spread out. Our clinicians work full time in the OR. So it's really difficult for us to um, make them feel like they're part of the leadership team, part of the decision making team. And through this crisis, we've implemented some weekly and monthly teams 
meetings, uh, some virtual meetings in which we're engaging one another. And initially it was just to talk about the COVID crisis and how it was affecting them at their locations and to share ideas and strategies from a clinical perspective on tools that they could use to improve their practices, to keep themselves safe. Well, then once the pandemic and the virus infections started to slow in the hospitals or the concerns slowed down a bit, we were able to twist and pivot and use this as an opportunity and a time to share innovative practices that they've developed, um, administrative practices that work well for their teams and challenges that we're all facing together. And, and so these monthly meetings, I think are now a part of the lifeblood of who we are as an organization. I think they will continue long after. And it's really been um, surprising and exciting how even in the midst of this chaos, our team has come together to face the new challenges and then have some wins and, and develop something new that will be beneficial going forward. Um, and again, I don't know if this crisis is over, none of us do. So we've had this fluid plan and this process that we can now choose to send teams home or have them work from the office and all without missing a beat. Um, so thank you guys for that involvement and suggestion of using the Splash Shop application that has allowed our team to cost effectively do their jobs. Um, they're, they're able to still securely uh, get the data that they need. Um, so really that, that collaborative approach was really great. Awesome. And Barclay, would you like to share a little bit about, I mean, you're there every week. Well, you're not there physically now, <laughs> but you're there virtually now. Um, just because you're there, you know, share with us some things that you pick up as a result of being, uh, you know, Eric has been very strategic in making us feel like we're a part of the team. You're in the uh, meetings, their business meetings, we're on the quarterly uh, roadmap and all of that. So would you like to share a little bit about what that looks like from your perspective? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, one of the big challenges we've had over time is as remote workers, uh, more clinicians and hospital coordinators throughout the country. There's some unique challenges when dealing with hospitals and their networks. Uh, being in these meetings has allowed me to really pick up on when uh, new agreements with uh, LifeLink's clients are starting so that we can step, uh, take a step back and plan. It's also allowed us to implement new solutions uh, early on before COVID ever hit in regards to cloud technology. So moving them to Office 365 to be able to leverage more collaborative tools <clears throat> and be able to use better communication uh, has been essential obviously during this time. Uh, one of the other things I think is just to better understand what all goes into a contract for a LifeLink with one of their clients. Um, healthcare can be very complex with all of its rules and requirements. And so being so entrenched with LifeLink for the past eight years, it's helped me be able to listen and pick up on things that will help implement new technologies to support their business growth and uh, challenges. Awesome, awesome. And, and Joe, I, I'd like to get your feedback and Erica at the same time, because Erica, as we moved forward in the face of COVID, not only were you looking for ways to allow your uh, team to work remotely, but you also had to factor in security. So that's one thing that they can, but how secure is that connection? How secure is the data going to continue to be? And so, uh, Joey, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, and Erica, give us uh, your feedback. Yeah, sure. So I think some of the really critical things we had to look at as everybody started working from home was, you know, home networks are, are not as secure as commercial networks. You know, most organizations spend a lot of money securing yeah. their edge, putting high quality enterprise level firewalls in place, building all of these defenses that and then as soon as our users go home, they're now outside of those defenses. So one, we had to do a lot of education to users saying, here are the things you need to be doing at home to, to really stay safe and maintain safety on your home network. But we also needed to be looking at those connections into our corporate structures. What, what, is, what does our VPN look like? What is our remote access solution? 
How secure is it? Is it encrypted? Is the data protected as it, as it moves across those lines? What kind of controls does that solution have in place from a authentication perspective? Can I force multi-factor authentication? I talked about that earlier. Um, can I, you know, suppress file transfers out of the network if that's something that I'm interested in or something that I need? Can I monitor the solution to make sure that I'm not seeing people try to authenticate from, from countries where I don't have employees that are now trying to get into my system? You know, all of those things needed to be looked at so that, that we could really make sure that, that as we adjusted and tried to really rapidly deploy a, a, a robust remote access solution, that it still checked all of those boxes. Because the last thing we wanted to do was introduce a big, huge security hole into people's networks um, just because it was urgent, right? And, and especially since the attackers out there, they knew everybody was moving to home. So they were trying to take advantage of the, the fact that people were in home offices. We saw that with some of the home uh, consumer grade routers that all of a sudden they were, they were definitely targeted for attack because the attackers knew, hey, I've now got this entire workforce that's working from home. They're outside of that security. I'm going to take advantage of it. So it, there were a lot of factors in play there. And, and I'm very glad we did find a, a solution that really allowed us to, to meet those needs rapidly and at relatively low cost as well. Awesome. Eric, anything to add to that? I was just so thankful that those were things that our partner was thinking about and that during this time where we were so focused on the operational side and how how and when to shift and, and what to do in response to this crisis. It was so great to have a partner who could make those decisions, suggest tools that had already been vetted, um, and then move forward with a rapid in, uh, implementation. Awesome. And all of this, uh, you know, the last bullet point here, short-term, long-term uh, solutions. <laughs> Solutions in general are evolutionary process and it culminates typically in a roadmap, a guide, a, a playbook uh, that shows short term needs and long term objectives. So LifeLink needed a quick short term fix for remote access and we were able to provide that. And then longer term, we were looking at what else can we do depending on how long this COVID lasts and, and as we continue to go down uh, the road. So with all of that, what I'd like to do is uh, take us to the next slide and bring it home with uh, some takeaways from uh, today's webinar. So uh, with that, uh, you know, we talk about meeting rhythms um, and I'd, I'd like to hear Erica's feedback on meeting rhythms and, actually, and Barclay, you as well. Um, what I would, the only thing I would add to meeting rhythms is, uh, my former partner, he introduced me to a book by Vern Harnish called the Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. That book and one other called uh, Traction by Entrepreneurial Operating System, really those two books give, uh, it, it makes your meetings become on steroids. It really invigorates them and makes them uh, to where you're having maximum productivity from your team uh, and from the meeting itself. Um, but I think those are two really good books. Um, Erica, Barkley, do y'all want to chime in and just talk about how uh, the meeting rhythms have affected LifeLink, how it's helped us help them, things like that? Absolutely. I can't understate the value of having Barclay at our meetings. Um, again, we being in this dynamic growth mode, it requires a pretty frequent meeting. I think that our meeting weekly is important because things change on a weekly basis, even when we're not in crisis. And having Barclay at the table to hear about those changes really allows us to address them, um, plan for them, prepare for them. Um, our weekly meetings have a very structured agenda. It moves very quickly. It ends with everyone taking some responsibility for their deliverables for the following week, which allows Barclay to see what the priority should be um, it gives us the opportunity to then the following week report on those priorities. And it, it's been a really great tool. Um, and then as we talked about before, we're also doing either monthly or quarterly reviews of these strategies and plans and really pulling apart the bigger projects at those meetings. And each serves a purpose, each has a value. And again, it, having 
all the people, including IT at the table, really creates for an effective meeting. Well, and one thing I will add to that is um, it goes back to having the right people in the meeting, having each department represented to look at not just IT and how IT can support the business, but understanding the entire goal and business objective uh, for the company, whether it's rapid growth mode, a pandemic, or um, even right-sizing contracts with your clients or uh, your own company, it's very important to make sure that each, individ each individual team is represented to, represented to get the buy-in, the, the understanding, and the cohesive team effort to move forward in the right direction. And just one more note on having the right people in the room. Um, our CEO is not tech savvy. I think Barclay might even laugh at, at the idea. Um, I do not choose to be tech savvy. I dive in as much as possible. And I think I cannot stress enough that having that trust and the relationship with VC3 to let them be our technical partner, to let them guide us in that decision making is really important. Um, obviously, we have a compliance team and they do a great job of working with the security team. Um, we have operational people who know the processes that need to be accomplished, but having VC3 as that partner to tell us how to accomplish those objectives, how to do so in a secure way, it, it's really why we have them here, why they are a partner and why they participate in these meetings. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I, I think, you know, as you look at what can we take away from today and it, it, analyzing how often are we meeting? Are they productive? What is the cadence? Is it the right cadence? Is it the wrong cadence? And adjusting uh, accordingly and then wrapping around that, you know, maybe some structure uh, from that traction book I told you about and the uh, mastering the Rockefeller habits. Uh, what else can we do? Uh, confirm IT's leadership, understand a business. So, you know, does IT truly understand the mission, the goals, and the vision of the company that they service. And uh, Erica, you want to talk about that and how you feel we, Barclay, VC3, understands uh, your business goals? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think the key here is that VC3 doesn't just function in a vendor capacity. I think a lot of times when we look at contracted services, we think of them as a vendor. Similarly, with our organization, as we're working in hospitals and developing anesthesia teams, we attempt to partner with them. We understand their ORs. We understand how they flow. And we're treated as a collaborative partner in how to make that work effectively. And I think the same can be said about our relationship with VC3 in that we're collaborative. Uh, we work in, in tandem and in partnership. And not simply, we need product X, and then the vendor saying, here's your cost. It's how can we get this mission accomplished effectively and securely? Um, and so really it's that distinguishing trait of a partnership versus a vendor relationship that is so meaningful. And, and the reason that you guys are able to partner and understand our mission and our goals. Yeah, thank you. Are there anything to add to that? I would say that uh, having the buy-in from LifeLink's leadership mm -hmm. team to yeah. really have their departments come to us with some of their challenges, whether it be the wrong software program or we want to be able to create a document management platform that everyone can access from wherever but still be secure. That type of collaborative effort is makes my job from a VCIO to be able to look at the right solutions for them so much easier but then also understanding the compliance needs to be able to bring Joe in from a um, information, chief information security officer to also leverage his expertise to help them as well and for all of us just to work as a team, uh, which leads us into the next bullet point, which is assess the value of your IT reports. And a lot of what we look at is not just ticket metrics and ticket volumes and who needed their password reset. What I'm looking for is a holistic what does our roadmap need to look like? Uh, companies typically have organizational roadmaps from strategic growth to new business initiatives they want to implement. Well, technology needs to support those. And so it's looking at uh, your 
operational expenses as well as your capital expenditures for this year versus next year versus four to five years down the road, what do those major goals and objectives need to look like? And it changes constantly. So it's always a living, breathing document that you need to work on to uh, consistently grow and make sure that all of the needs, not just from a security standpoint, but also a productivity standpoint are met. Very good, very good. And Joe, I know you touched this uh, on this briefly a moment ago, but uh, I didn't know if you want to expand on this, but I thought it was really good advice on this next bullet point about getting an outside perspective uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, certainly, you know, it's so important to partner with people outside your organization who understand security. Even if you have an IT department and you have somebody in charge of security and who is, is managing security and understand security for your organization, you still want that outside view. Um, frequently, engineers, even security people are somewhat blind to the own, own systems they have designed. So having somebody outside test those systems uh, having audits done to see how effective your processes and policies are at keeping you secure from an outside organization, having vulnerability scans run on the outside of your network so that um, you know you're buttoned up nice and tight and that you don't have obvious holes out there, and then penetration tests. If you really believe, hey, we've got a good, robust security solution, uh, we, we deploy patches every month, our firewalls are secure, we, we think we've got this nailed, have an outside organization come in and test that. Can they get through those defenses? Um, find that out proactively rather than, as, as Gary talked about earlier, rather than after an incident, finding out I had a hole. Find it out ahead of time so you can mitigate those risks and really keep yourself buttoned down. We really liken this to financial audits. Every organization has an outside auditor come in every year and look at their finances. Doesn't mean you don't trust your controller. Doesn't mean you don't trust your finance department. It's just you need that outside view to make sure everything is on the up and up and is, is as you expect. And you want the same thing with security. You want that outside view to make sure that you are remaining secure and really to test those systems that you have in place. Awesome. Awesome advice. This last one, I, you know, the takeaway I think about that in involving IT, and Barclay touched on this, is, you know, involve IT in all facets of your business and your strategy. Don't wait until an event occurs to get IT involved. By then, it's probably too late. Mistakes are uh, certain to happen. Uh, they need to be an integral part, and can, IT can help pave the way for a prosperous future in the business. So. With that, uh, Jeremy, what I think I'd like to do is uh, say thank you to everyone. I hope it was informative. I hope you learned something today that you can take back to your business. And uh, open it up, uh, turn it back over to Jeremy, and we're happy, if time permitting, to answer any questions. Yep. I've, uh, I've sent a few of the questions, which you all already answered, which is good. The only one I think that was kind of left out there, which is actually a good one, I think, to kind of wrap up on is um, – and I can go back to the chat box, but basically the gist of it was, is what's one lesson that you've learned through COVID-19 that is going to make you come out stronger after this pandemic is, is hopefully over. Um, so what's one lesson? I think each one of you kind of chiming in from your vantage point would be interesting, but what's one lesson you've learned going through this that you think will help you come out stronger in the end? All right. Ladies first, Erica, Barclay. <laughs> Sure. Um, there have been several, but I think that um, just having a disaster plan, um, thinking about scenarios and planning accordingly is a really important thing. Um, again, when we've done scenario planning in the past, it was what happens if a tornado hits one location, not what happens if everybody is sent to work from home. Um, so just really reviewing your disaster plans and, and keeping those uh, current and making sure that all components of that are in place or ready to be easily deployed has been something I know will become a part of, of who we are going forward. And I would just add to that, uh, not only the planning, but breaking the planning and what the solutions are down into bite-sized chunks, uh, especially security and uh, business continuity planning can seem like a huge elephant. Uh, you can always eat the entire elephant. It just takes one bite at a time. So breaking 
each uh, singular objective down and then planning from a budgetary and implementation perspective accordingly and really prioritizing what those are to get those laid out effectively. And I would say great answers. Um, you know, as I think about what's one lesson I've learned is I don't, this may sound tongue in cheek, but it's not, it's to expect the, uh, the unexpected. So in other words, as Eric was saying, don't wait. You know, if you've got plans to mitigate your risk to a pandemic or security or whatever it is, don't put them off, do it now. And uh, the other thing I would say, uh, a lesson that I've learned is that no matter what you do in life, change is going to happen. And I don't know who quoted it, uh, but it, I like the saying, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. And I, I just think it's a very appropriate because with, in the face of COVID, we've had so much change. I mean, I'm working from home uh, 100% now. Uh, our clients have changed. VC3's changed. Change is inevitable. It's going to happen. And I, happen, and I think how you embrace that will be the hallmark and the character, you know, that you build up and you, you've got to be willing to embrace those changes. Uh, and I think I touched on this earlier. I think one of the, the biggest things that I think was critical as people moved home is, is that user education and user employee oh, security awareness because once those users move outside of my carefully constructed protections that I've put in place on my corporate network, if I've trained them and I have really made them aware and, and encouraged safe computing practices, um, they're still going to be safe at home, even though they're outside of those protections. Um, so that is, is just so critically important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been touched on as well, just the importance of reviewing those plans, looking at your business continuity and disaster recovery plan, looking at your incident response plan, and really being willing to kind of tear those apart and look at them from a fresh set of eyes and say, okay, how does this impact these things? And what do I need to modify in these plans? Because it is a different world. And, and how does this impact how I'm going to respond to incidents? Um, and then, of course, just the safety and security around all of our communications. I think that's the other thing that really was critical. I've, I've been amazed at how we have all adjusted to to Microsoft Teams and, and GoToMeeting and all of these other tools that allow us to do remote sessions and remote conferences and, and meetings. It's, it's pretty amazing and pretty impressive, actually. Awesome. Wrap up and talk about Eric on your end and then maybe Gary or Joe on your end, but just where to go for more information. So Gary has it up on the screen, the website, but talk about website, social media, phone numbers. Where would you direct everyone to learn more about your organizations? I think certainly our website's a great place to start. It has all of our contact information um, and you can even, I think, email me directly from there. Makes it easy. Gary, what about yeah. you? Yeah, so obviously websites, you know, they're chock full of information. We do have all kinds of contact information. We have our locations in it. We have what we do. Um, certainly uh, you can reach out uh, locally uh, to us. Um, I don't know if our email addresses are on there, but happy to entertain any questions if someone thinks of something up with this webinar. And what we'll do is we'll follow up. So we've been recording this webinar. We'll push this out online so that you can watch and review this. We'll also send a thank you for attending email. We'll include your emails and contact information so that way everyone Perfect. can connect directly. So that'll make it very, very easy. But thank you to our panelists, our team, Erica, Gary, Joe, Barclay. Thank you for spending your time with us and your expertise and sharing that. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you again soon on the next webinar, but um, we appreciate you tuning in and we'll be in touch soon. Be safe, be healthy. Right. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you all. all right.